day I got my degree from MIT, which was June 4th, 1940, France fell to the Germans. So anybody with any brains would know that we weren't going to avoid war too long. The British were fighting desperately uh, against the German Air Force, which was superb. And uh, so I signed up uh, uh, shortly after I'd got my, I went to work, but I signed up and I got called and went into the service in uh, February 1941, getting my wings and, and getting married before uh, our war started. And I went through, uh, I was a, a big ape compared with a lot of guys, so they put me through two engine school. Uh, there were 900 of us that got our wings, but only 100 of us got our wings in two engine airplanes. And I was one of the 100. And, and th then, because I was good, I guess, they kept making me an instructor. They wouldn't let me go to war. And uh, the colonel wanted me around. In fact, I was the colonel's personal pilot. <laughs> and. Uh, I finally went to war, but I didn't get to war until 1944, and, and uh, the theater chosen was the South Pacific. And of course, the South Pacific was actually this pretty safe place except for the water. The Japanese by 1944, when I got there, had been decimated by earlier fighter pilots, guys like Bong and, and uh, O'Hare and those guys had uh, taken all the really good Japanese fighter pilots down, so I got there it was fairly safe. It, it wasn't <laughs> totally safe, of course. There were plenty of Japanese around, and, and, uh, but I survived it. You know, the airplane got hit, and a couple of guys got scratched. I never got a scratch. Some missions were known as Zoot. And zoot missions were, you, you love to get assigned to a zoot mission because uh, you flew out over the target and you never saw any flak, you never saw any fighters, but there was some supplies or something that the government wanted destroyed. But when you went to Truk or to Balak Papin, uh, Truk was a tremendous Navy place and uh, uh, it had to be destroyed because they could hide their their planes and the airplane, uh, I mean, the air, naval equipment there. Balak Papin was the source of a lot of their oil in Borneo. And uh, and then, of course, Corregidor was uh, a, a symbol of the United States power. It was in the entrance to Manila Harbor. All of these things had to be either neutralized or destroyed, which of course neutralized them in effect. And they were scary missions. Uh, uh, missions to Yap where the, you flew out over eight or 900 miles away from your base to find an island that was only five miles long, <laughs> you know. When you came home with three engines, you know, you wanted to get home. You didn't want to bail out over water with a, and be in a life raft. That was even less appealing. <laughs> we found a lot of guys, though. Uh, we had uh, our protection, no, because we had no fighters. Our protection was uh, two engine amphibian airplanes that we called Dumbos because they took off at 85 knots. They, climbed at 85 knots, they cruised at 85 knots, and they landed at 85 knots. <laughs> and, uh, but they could land in water, and they could pick up as many as 10 people without overloading the thing. And, and if the water was anything like smooth, they could get off and bring them home. The guys, of course, in the water would, would put up a silver tarps so they would contrast with the blue water. When the nippers came over, they would uh, put the blue side up. But when we flew over, they'd put the silver side up and they'd tilt it, try and catch the light uh, reflections, and they had little hand mirrors. And, and uh, we found a lot of them out there. And we also found some guys that had written SOS on a beach one place. 
the Japanese were on the island, but they hadn't caught the guys, and, and the Dumbo went in and, and picked them up. There was a, a specifically aggressive Japanese pilot that had a green airplane with a red meatball on it. Most of them were silver and had the red meatball, but this guy uh, was uh, obviously a squadron commander and experienced, and he would fly right through your formation, usually spinning, you know, spraying bullets in every direction, but he'd come right between you. <laughs> and you didn't know where the hell the bullets were going to go. Our guys wouldn't be able to hit him. We finally, one day, he didn't show up, so somebody must have got him. Not necessarily my outfit, but some outfit. Uh, there was a time just before the Navy was going to invade uh, Palau, Palau is a group of islands that are east of the Philippines by a considerable amount, maybe as much as 400 miles. And they wanted absolutely up-to-date photography of any uh, underwater obstacles that the Japanese had put in there because they impede the invasion badly. And so uh, I was foolish one night and I volunteered to go up there. I figured that, you know, I could make it, but I'd get a medal. <laughs> and uh, they were told us how high to fly over, which was very high, like 22,000 feet. But when we got there, you see, all the weather was known to the Japanese because it all came down from the west. And so we never knew what the weather was going to be the next day, but the Japanese always knew because it was the, their weather blew over our area. And so we had to go down to 9,000 feet to break out and get the photographs. And of course, the nippers could get up to 9,000 feet pretty fast. So I was uh, taking pictures, and, and to break the, the picture taking is a serious thing because the cameras are called trimetricon cameras, and they take three pictures simultaneously, one vertically and one angling off to the left and one angling off to the right. And when they, the way they do it, they can actually measure the height of a building and the height of a pole or the, even the height of a person maybe if they wanted to. And so to break the, the flight over the beach was, was serious business, but I would have to break mine and, and scurry up into the clouds I had no, no, no other guns except my own, and uh, they had, they actually got on our not on our tail, but they were attacking. But uh, uh, quite frankly, I I turned so violently into them. They were stupid pilots. And I turned so violently into them that they would fly overhead, but my guys couldn't hit them either. <laughs> oh. Uh, it was a happy ending to my flight. Nobody was hurt on my airplane. We didn't even lose an engine. And we got some very good photographs for the Navy. A big mission of our day was, was uh, uh, four squadrons, each sending six airplanes. And we always sent a spare. Uh, so there would be up to 28 airplanes, but some of them would always never get to the target. Oh, that was a big mission, whereas in, in Europe they would actually send a thousand airplanes to uh, Bremen or Berlin or something all at one time. So it was vastly different. And of course they had fighter escort. We never had fighter escort. Lindbergh came out there and, and, and went and showed us how to run the engines using less gas. Lindbergh was the world, uh, be world's best uh, conservator of gasoline. When he got to Paris, he could have flown all the way to Rome, uh, but he didn't because he said he was going to Paris, and uh, he would have made even a, a better record, you might say, in a distance fly. But uh, the fact that we had small formations and, and no fighter escort was, and over water all the way, so that when you came home, if you didn't make it home, there wasn't any land uh, like in, in, 
in Europe, and you were bombing Germany, you had France to land in, or Belgium to land in, or Luxembourg, or someplace like that. We didn't have any of that. Well, of course, the Liberator was a, a, a shoulder uh, wing uh, airplane, and it came apart when you hit the water. A B-17 was a low wing, and it would skitter and slow down, uh, you know, many times faster than you land on, on land, but uh, well, our plane would almost stop in the first few feet. So, uh, the airplane always came apart, and then uh, the nose would crush in on the pilot's legs, and few guys got out of water landings. Well, a kind of regular number was 10 people. We had uh, six gunners. four officers, and the four officers were pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier. And of course, the bombardier not only dropped the bombs and had very little to do, nothing to do really, until we got to the target, but on the way home, he was, he was also doctor. So anybody that got hurt, he was the one to give the, uh, morphine and bind the wounds and comfort the guy because the other guys were busier than hell. First of all, he had to put the fuses in the bombs because you didn't take off with fuses. You, uh, if you drop the bomb's fuse, they just conceivably could go off even if you hadn't pulled the pins out. And he had to go down and, and fuse them and then wait until you were almost in the target and pull the pins out. Uh, they had a little propeller on the front of the bomb, and, and as, as long as it had a pin through the propeller, it couldn't spin. And the propeller would spin and, and, and expose the timer, and then when it hit, the, the thing would go off. Uh, so you wanted to, yeah, he had to do that, and uh, he had to check out all his timers so that the bombs would land 20 feet apart or 50 feet apart or whatever you wanted if it was a a target with a, a lot of space, you might even drop them 100 feet apart. So he had a lot of work to do, uh, but it was only just uh, before the bombs fell. When the bombs fell, he could sleep all the way home if not when he was hurt. Yeah, it was a Norton bomb site, but it wouldn't do what they said it would do, you know. They said it would drop, you could drop a bomb into a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet, but you needed 10,000 pickle barrels down there to do it. <laughs> we always uh, attacked their bases because that's where the fighters came from. But in attacking their bases, of course, we destroyed supplies. The, the Japanese largely had their their oil supplies in 55-gallon drums in the in the woods around the. You know, the woods are very dense in the, in the Pacific Islands, and it, uh, sometimes you had uh, watchers that told us where the you know people that were angry at the Japanese for invading their place, and so we would bomb those supplies. Of course, sometimes we'd get some pretty good fires going on you know, when we bombed Balak Papin. Smoke was up over 30,000 feet. Uh, but then uh, that was a very special place. There was all sorts of fuel around on the surface. And then uh, Terracan, which is in the north edge of uh, Borneo, uh, the, you could see the tanks. They were huge, round tanks. And they were painted camouflage, but you could see they were steel and you'd try and uh, destroy them. But you try and destroy the fighters on them. Airbase first. Despite the advertisements for the consolidated Volte, the B-24 went 157 miles an hour. Um, it would go 300 miles an hour straight down. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Japanese fighters, I'm sure, would go 250. So they would uh, they would pull ahead of you from the rear very very fast, and uh, when they get it even you you were still moving forward they would start turning in on you they're very hard to hit F 
Flack, of course, was totally unpredictable. When you had a fighter, you, you knew what he was going to do, but, but sometimes you'd have to fly through a field of Flack, and, and you'd see him, and you'd hear him once in a while, and you'd smell him when you went. Uh, but, of course, they didn't hurt you. If you smelled them, it was because the air came blowing through your air intake. So, but uh, uh, the flak was uh, pretty scary because you just never knew when one was going to hit you. If you were in a field of, and you know, guys would, would describe flak so heavy you could walk on it, they'd they'd box the whole sky. They would know that you were. At Say 20,000 feet, and they'd shoot their shells off to go between 21, off between 21,000 and 23,000. And, and uh, sometimes they were in front of you, and sometimes they were off the side or behind you. And, and sometimes they hit. I had my airplane hit many times, but uh, never personally got hit. I mean, you would hear the, the stuff rattle off the, and make holes in the aluminum. Even drafty holes in the aluminum, but uh, for some reason or other, they never hit me. His whole uh, turret revolves, of course, only uh, probably through 90 degrees. Uh, he can't uh, damage any parts of your own airplane. It's limited. The, uh, but he's totally isolated, the same as the, the top turret and the ball turret. The ball turret, of course, uh, he has to. He, he, the turret is sitting with the guns pointing aft when you land and, and taxi. And so when he wants to get in it hydraulically, he turns it, and then he gets in, and then he brings it back. And they're electric motors but he, that run it. But he can go from shooting forward right under the bomb bay to shooting backward right under the tail turret. And uh, the top turret guy is isolated too. And he's right back of the pilot and co-pilot. Uh, one time, one of my gunners, uh, it must have been brand new, I told the crew to test fire all their guns as we approach the target, and they just go brrp, brrp. And this guy fired his guns right over the cockpit and, and destroyed the, the night light bulbs. They burst and showered down on my shoulders. I had a few words to say with him. Uh, he should have fired straight up in the air. And uh, there was nobody behind us that he couldn't have fired, and the bullets would all get back there. But he had um, cams so that he couldn't shoot the rudder tops off. Uh, if he got excited and was traced, tracking a zero and, and he came to the rudder, the gun would be interrupted until he didn't have the <laughs> rudder in view. The navigator had a desk uh, back of the pilot, but uh, when he wanted to shoot the stars, he had to go down into the bombardier's compartment because they had a little dome down there that he could stick his head up in with his sext octant. When you're up there for 13 or 14 hours, uh, you've got to go and urinate. And uh, now you can't use the pilot's relief tube because it flows on the ball turret gunner. And he doesn't, he doesn't like that. I don't know why they even put one in the airplane, but we always got up and went back to the camera hatch, which was, and it wouldn't bother the, the tail gunner. One time I got up and as I was getting back into the seat, we hit an air b a bump in the air and my head and, and, and my helmet punched all four feather buttons. And so all four engines stopped turning. And, and, and <laughs> of course, I started down on all my squadron. And what the hell's going on? And I. Did you know what happened? Oh, instantly knew what had happened. It was dead silence. And, and I yanked all the throttles and mixture controls back and pushed the pulled the buttons out and then brought the mixture in and the throttle very slowly. Two throttles and a balance. Well, we probably only lost 300 feet, but it, it was... Pretty scary. Yeah, I was hoping they didn't start again. I would have been in the middle of the Pacific with no engines. I was always scared. You're a damn fool if you say you're not scared, but... Uh, <laughs>
Sometimes I was more scared than others. Right now, I've been in the Air Force for 71 years. <laughs> but of course, that's, that's just to shock you. I was in the reserves and on active duty for about 30 years and in retirement for about 30 years. And, uh, and so they all add, add up to that. I've been drawing a salary from Uncle Sam for 71 years, almost 72 now. I was born in San Francisco. When I was two and a half, my father uh, was uh, selected to open a new office in Los Angeles for a Trans-Pacific passenger and freight service. Um, and so we moved to Los Angeles where I grew up. Los Angeles in those days uh, was the melting pot of the United States. So I grew up not in a Japanese American uh, enclave. I would say predominantly an Italian and Mexican neighborhood in the melting pot of Los Angeles. I had graduated from high school at age 16 and so and, and by the way so is my wife uh, and so at that point I was in my second year I was a sophomore engineering student at the University of California at Los Angeles uh, so I completed one and three quarters years of college and had received credit for it President Roosevelt put a steel embargo on Japan and followed that with an oil embargo. Now my father being in the uh, Trans-Pacific shipping business uh, realized perhaps better than most people what was going on. My father took me aside and said uh, President Roosevelt has put Japan in a corner and Japan will retaliate. So when the retaliation occurred, I was very surprised at the audacity of the Pearl Harbor attack, but I knew it was coming. And it was May of 1942 when I moved to Manzanar. And we could only take what we could carry. That was quite difficult. On the other hand, uh, my parents were fairly clever and packed some uh, suitcases and trunks, left them with neighbors to ship to us because you could hardly have enough things with you to carry. The inmates of the camp supplied all the labor. Uh, there were outside administrators uh, and a bunch of soldiers uh, on watchtowers uh, next to barbed wire fences uh, with searchlights at night to make sure we didn't escape. Uh, it was rather uh, awesome to be uh, imprisoned in that way. Um, the first job I had was as a junior cook. Uh, the uh, chef was a man who had run a restaurant in his everyday life, so he took a bunch of us kids aside and taught us how to chop and how to slice meat and everything. And as it turned out, uh, what I learned 
was helpful in later life. The living accommodations were very, very primitive. These uh, barracks, so to speak, were put up in a big hurry. Uh, so the, the wood was uncured. As a consequence, the wood shrunk. Uh, the, the walls were covered with uh, tar paper on the outside and stapled down. The appearance was uh, uh, quite gruesome that we were in the high desert and in the spring and in the fall. You get dust storms, you get wind and sand storms. And so, as you might imagine, the sand and the dust blew into the rooms from all the cracks in particular uh, from the floors. But also, it was very, very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. The night before I uh, was scheduled to leave, uh, my parents got into a big, big argument. Uh, my father took the position that I should not leave to go to college. His position was that I was the only child and that if I were to leave and go out there, I could easily be killed. The American public on the West Coast in particular had been uh, brought to a condition by uh, the evacuation and the press that uh, Japanese Americans were our enemy. And so there was considerable fear of uh, personal harm. Well, my mother became very angry and said he, he must go and take his chances. If he's killed, okay, at least he tried and I want him to go. And as a consequence, the following day when I left, I was very frightened. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. At any rate, I um, arrived at the University of Missouri in February of 1943, and I discovered that the campus was quite benign. I was just another student and another kid. And looking back on it, had I schemed to do it, I couldn't have done it better. I went from a good institution to a better one for a master's degree and to a world-renowned university for my doctorate. That experience uh, I believe led to my selection as a deputy director of the National Reconnaissance Office a number of years later, uh, where I ran the uh, US spy satellite program at a time when the United States government would not admit to the existence of such an organization. Uh, it's incredible that you went from a distrusted American to one of the most trusted Americans uh, in the United States. That you were uh, signing memoranda over to the White House that were highly, highly classified, uh, working out some details of 
what you might call uh, spying over other countries. This could not have happened any place else but in America. Only in America could just a sequence have occurred.